Hallelujah. God is always worthy of praise, and his word is always a life-giving power in our lives. It is my joy to share with you from the word of God things that he has showed me, which strengthened me. I would like to pray before we even begin. Heavenly Father, we know that you are the giver of life, the creator of all that is within us, the giver of all good things. We thank you that you held nothing back when you came to earth to give us Jesus. Thank you that you withhold nothing from those of us who are called according to your purpose and walk according to your ways. Thank you that you want so much more from you than we can even imagine. Father God, many of us are in hurting places. Many of us have been through some battles. Many of us have been through some hard times, but you are walking with us through this life, and we thank you for your faithfulness and kindness. We thank you that you never leave, never abandon, never forsake us. You already paid everything for our lives, and so we know you are not going to quit now. Thank you, King Jesus. We commit this day's word to your service and to your spirit. We pray that your word will speak into the hearts of everyone in this room and those listening online as well. Father, we pray that your word will bring life to those who hear today. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. I always have to say it's not the speaker that matters, it's what the Lord is telling you in your own heart, okay? So um, Pastor Jim, Pastor Steve, Pastor Justin, Pastor Felix, I mean, we have a thousand preachers in this house, but it's God who speaks to us. All right. Last time I spoke here, I spoke about um, our year theme is Jesus building, and I spoke about building together and being kind of living stones that are fit together to build his house. And I talked about how a stone is not a brick. A brick is sort of interchangeable. You can take any brick and put it into place, and if it breaks or something, you can just take it out and put in another one. But if you're building a house of stone, then each stone has to be fit in. So it's more work to be a stonemason than a bricklayer. You have to find the right stone to fit that place and then build the stones together. And that's what Jesus does in his church, in his congregation, that each one of us is uniquely, one of a kind, uniquely fashioned by the creator God. And then he has a way, a masterful way of putting this stone next to this stone. And sometimes the rough edge needs to get worn off a little bit, but sometimes there's a hole that needs to be filled by my space, by, by something that I have. And so we are living stones being built together. And it is great joy to celebrate finding when we are joined together. We're, when we're kind of just in a pile of rubble, there's something missing, right? But when you see how God builds us together, there's great joy in that. Today I want to talk a little different. Today I want to talk more about to individuals among us because many of us kind of don't know where to fit or where we belong in this world. There's so many of us that uh, things change around us and we go, I don't know where I belong. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to find nourishment. I don't know where to find strength. I don't know where I belong in this world. And so today I would like to talk about how each of us is uniquely fashioned by God, but also our walk with God, our bond with God when we are bonded with him, he has a place for us in his heart. And all of the externals can change around us, but we have a rock to stand on. We have a place where we belong because he has made a place for us. Okay? So today I'm talking more to individuals instead of the community as a, as a whole. All right. I want to start talking. This is a little strange. I want to talk about labels. Okay? When you go to, uh, let's say I'm going to go out to eat and I can choose Chinese or American or Vietnamese or Korean or uh, uh, Indian. There's a thousand choices. And how do I choose the restaurant? Usually I look at the sign out front. Oh, Korean food, I want that. Um, one little exception, there's a Korean restaurant on Snelling Avenue that says in Korean, Hanguk Shikdang, that means Korean restaurant. In, in English, I forget if it's Vietnamese or Burmese or if, anyway, in, you know, the English sign says something and the Korean sign says Korean. So if you're Korean, you know where to look. And if you're Vietnamese, you know that it's probably not really Vietnamese. But anyway, it's okay. How we, we project ourselves, right? Because we want to reach an audience or a person or a, a clientele. We, we put something on the surface so that people will come. And that's the hope. Now, um, say the grocery store. Say I'm going to go find tuna fish. So I look for tuna fish. There it is on the can. But when you look behind the label, then I've got to decide, do I want water or, or oil in this tuna fish? Um, or coffee. Do I want 
beans or do I want grounds? Do I want fine grounds or do I want coarser grounds? Do I want dark roast, medium, or light? See, the label says coffee, but there's a lot of variation within the label. How much more with people? When you're talking with people, how do we present ourselves? If I'm going to pre uh, introduce myself to someone who's never met me, we were going to the uh, ANFC picnic last Sunday, and I, there was someone there that I had never met before, and I thought, how shall I describe myself so this person can know how to find me there? And I didn't like any of the ways I thought of describing myself. I'm too short, I'm too old, I'm too whatever, I'm too quiet or something. I didn't like any of the descriptions. So I decided, forget that, I won't even try. We'll just figure it out. When we'll meet each other one way or another. So the outer label, how we describe ourselves, how we present ourselves, kind of, it, it kind of changes over time and it can be accurate or inaccurate. It doesn't, doesn't really sum up the person that we're talking about. And especially because it's a two-way street, okay? So um, while I'm presenting myself to you, I'm also reading, what are you, how is this going in? How is this going in? So one example, just in myself, some, if I'm talking with someone pretty soon, they say, so what do you do for a living? And I have a choice. I can say I'm retired. I can say I'm a city bus driver. I can say I'm a pastor. I can say lots of things. And how I decide which label to wear in that conversation depends on how I'm reading you. If you seem like a church sort of person, then I'll give you my church credentials. If you seem like a street sort of person, I'll give you my street credentials. If you seem like, you know, uh, I don't quite know how to sum you up and you don't know quite, then I might say I'm retired because then, then we're saying, okay, so it's not that relevant right now, what I did for a living. See, but we choose a label to put on to how we present ourselves that will, we hope will advance the conversation, will let us go farther in the conversation. And it is a two-way street because I'm gauging you to see, is this, is this fitting? Is this reaching you? Or should I try a different angle? Because we want to be able to communicate. We want to be able to grow together a little bit. Sometimes we just say, no, I don't want tuna today. I, I'm really in the mood for roast beef. Um, you know, sometimes we say, okay, not today, that's fine. And we're polite, but we know that's the end of it. So with people, our labels are an introduction, but don't ever, ever, ever stop with the label. There's a person completely unique underneath the label, and when you get to know the person, the label becomes irrelevant, right? When you know the person, the label becomes irrelevant. I was thinking, um, I think Pastor Litovic is not here today. I, wasn't, I was trying to decide if I wanted to embarrass him or not. I, I will go ahead. If you're online, I bless you. <laughs> um, if I tried to describe Pastor Litovic to you, I could say, you know, he's, you know, he's healthy, he's fit, he's strong, he's very present, he always walks upright, he's very present, um, and he speaks with some authority, he's, he engages you. Um, but that's only the start of pastor. That's what he looks like outside. If I wanted to introduce my wife to you, I could tell you what she looks like. That's not my wife. With Pastor Litovic, they were one of the first families that welcomed us to this church. And his son took our son by the hand the first time we came and said, come on, I'll show you, and walked us into this church. So when I think of Pastor Litovic, I don't think of a very strong-looking man from Haiti who, who, you know, he's very kind of, kind of confident of himself and stuff. But I think of, this is Litovic. I don't, you know, I don't care about the externals. This is my friend. Now, my hope for us as congregations is that we would worry a little less about our labels and we would press a little quicker through to what's the person underneath this. We all have to do, we have to present ourselves, right? I mean, that's just human nature. Nothing wrong with that, but don't ever stop there. The deeper you go, the less the labels matter. How much more with um, dating or a job? I forgot to throw this in. If you're, if you're dating someone uh, on the dating apps, I think you usually put a picture to see if you're attractive enough or not. And then you're checking out the other pictures and go, oh, this person looks good. Maybe I'll start with that. So you make a call, and then you make the presentation, and it's a two-way street. You're going, do I like this person or not? 
Is this worth exploring farther? But the farther you go, the, the more you've got, you're going beyond, below all of the things that are on the outside, and you're looking for what's this person like? If I'm going to get to know this person, I got to go way deeper than this. And so you have a meeting and all of that stuff. Same thing with a job interview. You, you know, you check the resume, you go, oh yeah, this looks good, looks good, looks good. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but we'll ask about it. You know, so when you get into the job interview, you present yourself, and you're checking them out, they're checking you out. When you get the job, the label doesn't matter as much. You've got to do the work. In the relationship, in the dating relationship, the, dating, the labels are irrelevant. You've got to make it work with this person. When you get married, the labels don't matter. What matters is we've got to make it work together because we're in this together now. Okay, so we're looking deeper. We all have labels. We all do it. We don't even think about it. It's just, you know, uh, how did you choose what to wear to church this morning? You know, how, what, in this church, is this okay? When I visit a church, it's always a hard question. Here I kind of know, because I've gone deeper than the labels. Right? But um, when we go to some place we don't know, then we choose how to present ourselves. Do I dress up or is casual okay? How did you choose what to wear? At, how did you choose who to talk to at the picnic? We had strangers there, and you're looking around, um, well, and Pastor Bet is telling us to pray with someone you don't know. How did you choose who to pray with? We look outside first and we go, hmm, maybe this one. And so we build on it. Okay. So people, we have labels and we're, we, we're all much more within that. With people, it's a two-way street because I'm presenting, but I'm also watching you to see how is this responding. And the goal is to come a little closer together. To, you know, it doesn't have to, I'm not saying you have to marry everyone you meet, but you have to, be building a relationship so that you know where you stand together. And that is so much of the richness of life is the people in our lives. It's not, it's not, um, not a thousand other things. The people in your life are what make it rich and worthwhile, right? Everything else leaves us a little empty. All right. So the deeper you go, the less the label matters. And I want us to get past go deeper than the labels, not just in church. I want that, you know, when I'm in the grocery store, you're my grocery clerk, but I want to know who are you and how's it going for you tonight? Because people matter. God created them. All right, so now our main text for the day is from 1 Samuel 16. This is where the Lord is choosing the king who will follow King Saul. King Saul was king and he kind of messed up and so God got mad at him and said, okay, you're out of here. I'm choosing your successor. And so God sent Samuel the prophet to meet the man who would be king, which was King David. I'm going to read 1 Samuel 16 and I'm going to start in verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. The Lord doesn't just look at your labels. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Verse 10, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. Are these all the sons you have? There's still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. The Lord, then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and, and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit came powerfully on David. Okay, David is the youngest son Samuel comes to, to anoint the next king, and David's not even invited to dinner. That's how people valued David. He's out with the sheep. He, oh, you know, he's irrelevant to this gathering, because this is for important people who might get promoted. And they, but the Lord says it's not the appearance, it's not how tall they are, it's not how strong they are, it's not... All of any of that stuff, the Lord is looking for a heart. And out of all seven of the older brothers, God said, no, no, there's something not quite what I'm looking for here. I want, there's got to be another. And so Sam, 
Samuel asked Jesse, is, is this all? And Jesse said, oh, there's the youngest guy, the punk of the family, the little one. We didn't even invite him to dinner. He's just taking care of the sheep so we can do this. And the Lord says, he's the one I want. So how often do we overlook someone God is treasuring and wants for a position because they don't match our picture of the style or the presentation that we want for our congregation or our church or our job or our marriage or whatever else. We have outer credentials and we get hooked on those things. Sometimes God has something deeper that we don't even see. God looks deeper than the outer presentation. Okay, now I'm going to flip this around a little bit and say, when you first started to encounter God, it's a two-way street. How do you present yourself to God when you're st first starting out? Take a good shower, scrub behind the ears, put on a good suit, clean up, try not to sin that day. If I wanted to talk to God, I better not do that tonight. We sort of put on an outer shell or an outer form that we want that we, so we can make a good impression on this God that we don't know very well yet. And we try to say, I hope he likes me, you know, but here I am, sir. You know, I don't know how you talk with God when you're first getting to know him. But he doesn't look at us like we look at ourselves either. He sees the heart, okay? So when we start to build a relationship with God, we try to present ourselves so that we'll get a favorable response. And God does not care too much about the external. The externals do matter, but that's not the heart of the matter. God wants to go way deeper than that. Do you remember in, in Matthew 7, uh, people were talking about the kingdom of God and all they had done for Jesus. And they said, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons and do all these great things in your name? And do you remember Jesus' words to them? He says, depart from me. I never knew you. See, what we do, even for God, we want to serve him. We want to honor him. Even what we do for God is secondary to knowing God. So when I come to God, I don't want to say, this is all I've done. Do you like it? I don't present him my resume and say all the things I've done in ministry in the years. That's not what makes God like me. It's like, do I know him? Does he know me? Does he, you know, are we getting along well or do we have some stuff we've got to clear out of the way so that we can have a better relationship? So God wants our heart, not our resume, not our credentials, not our job description. He wants our heart. And if we don't have that, then we're still dealing kind of externally. And God is never happy with externals alone. The externals do matter, but that's not the, if it stops there, you, we're missing the whole point. God works from the inside out, not the outside in. Psalm 139. I'm going to read, uh, Miss Priscilla on Mother's Day spoke beautifully. She had us read the whole psalm together, but I'm not going to do the whole psalm, but it's very, very powerful. This is what the Lord says, I mean, what David says to the Lord. Psalm 139, verse 13. You, God, created my inmost being. He didn't start out with the label, right? He started from the heart. You, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb before we're born. It's not what you did. It's where you're, where you're born from. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Skip down to, back to verse 1 now. You have searched me, O oh God. You know God. You have searched me. He knows what's inside, right? My labels don't impress him. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my coming in. Before you're familiar with all my ways and before a word is on my tongue, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So God has made a way for us to come into his presence. He's withholding nothing from us. We don't have to impress him with our resume, but we have to come into his presence and say, Lord, 
I want to know you, and I want you to know me. So I've got a list of references. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all of them, but I want to put them up here. This, this, these are references that speak to how much God wants to personally interact or know us. He doesn't want to, he's not just up in heaven seeing if we get it right. He wants to know us and walk with us. Okay, first one, Genesis 3. He walks in the garden. He's calling Adam and Eve by name. Where are you? Where are you? Now, God knew where they were. He knew what had happened, but there's some stuff we've got to deal with. If you're my son, we've got to talk. So where are you? He's, he's not, he didn't just blast them because you messed up and it cost the life of Jesus. He didn't just blast them, but he said, where are you? We want, he wants to dialogue with us. Good or bad, he wants to talk with us. Psalm 91, I love this psalm. I've been through it too many times. I don't want to preach it all today. But it talks about, it starts out, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Did you know God has a secret place, a shelter, a kind of a hidden place where it's just for you and him or a secret place where that's where he confides to you and where you can confide with him. It doesn't, it's not a public matter. It's not a, a sermon on a Sunday. It's you and him in a secret place. Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shelter of his presence. A thousand may fall but it won't come, right at your side, but it won't come near you. These are just um, phrases from that psalm. And it ends up with a, the Lord saying, because he cleaves to me in love, I will deliver him. Cleaves to me in love. That's not like, a, oh, I hope you're okay today. Father looks for us to cleave to him in love. And that's when that opens the relationship to where he wants to deliver us, not just say, oh, figure it out. Because he cleaves to me in love, I will deliver him. Psalm 139, I read a couple of verses, but the whole thing is full of this love that God has for us. Jesus, when he was teaching the disciples to pray, he said the Lord's Prayer, so familiar, our Father. That's a relational thing. It's not just the force be with you. It's, the, it's our Father. If you like your father or not, that's, that's a whole different issue. But he's your dad. He's got an investment in you. He's brought you into life. There's a relationship there, good or bad. There's a relationship. And Jesus tells us to call God our father. So he's not just a stranger. He's not just a force. When you're getting to know God, you can say, Father? If you don't know him yet, then say, I don't know you very well yet. We've been kind of estranged, but you're our father. You said so, so I'm going to hold you to that our Father. Jesus talks about the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to find one. Jesus talks about the good shepherd who knows and calls his sheep by name. Do you know God knows your name? He probably has a name for you um, that, that nobody else knows. We'll get to that a little later. God calls you by name. He doesn't say, hey, sheep number 40, 42 over there, get on, you know, I've got something for you. You better get in closer. He's got a name for each sheep. So he knows you by name, and he calls you by name. Oh, God, help us hear you when you call me. Help us hear you when you call us. Jesus, we're not anonymous to God. Jesus said he's preparing a place for us to be together with him. So it's not like, you know, yeah, we'll go to heaven and then we'll all be cool. We'll all be in the city of mass billions of people in, before the throne of God. But it's a place for me in his house. Isn't that cool? He knows what, what fits this guy. He knows what fits you. He knows what will be a good place for you in his house. And he's preparing a place for you. Jesus said that. I'm not making that up. Jesus said that. If he said it, he probably means it. He's probably going to find it for you. Jesus tells the disciples, John 15, you're no longer just servants, but now I call you friends. See the relationship side again? The relationship side? He wants us to be friends, not just at deliverer, not just a savior, not just uh, someone who does things for us, but friends. Man, that puts the relationship at a different level. Um, First Peter talks about that once we were nothing special, but now we, that's us, are God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to God. That's really special to me. If I look at the labels, I don't have too much to offer. But if I look at what he calls me, God's chosen people, 
royal priesthood, holy nation, people belonging to God. I want to belong to God. Our names are written in the book of life, and there's several references for that. It's not just, oh, it's not just a number. The old song, it's the number, <laughs> I'm not a number. Um, God has our names written in his book of life. That means he knows our name. He cares about if we're in or out of his book of life, and that means we have to have a relationship to be written in his book of life. We're going to talk about that a little more later also. Our names are written in the book of life. He, I, want our, I want my name in his book. I want your name. I don't want anyone in this house to miss out on having that name down. He writes down names. There's some warning that sometimes he blots out a name. Oh God, we've got to keep this relationship strong. I want my name in the book of life. There's, it's, again, it's not just one reference there. There's at least four that speak about the, our names being written in the book of life. And then, of course, that eventually he wants us, the church, the community of faith to become the bride of Christ. So now we're talking about a whole different level of relationship, right? It's not just, uh, not just good friends, not just dating, but he's got a life commitment for us in this marriage with his community. And we can, it's a two-way street. We can say, yes, I want this, or don't. No, I don't want this. I'd rather stay a little more distant. But when he calls the church, it's the bride of Christ. So that's where we are headed by God's grace. All right. Creator God is a God of love. He brought us into this life because he has love for us. He didn't have to bring us here, right? If he, he thought it was too painful, he would have said, no, let's not do this. He has good intentions for each life that he has created. He wants a relationship with us, not just a resume, not just a service, not just a function. We were made for him, and he was made for us. We were made for this relationship with God. And we, when we find that deep place in the heart that says yes to God, and no, he said yes to me, then we found something deep inside, an inner connection with life. And that heart-to-heart, -heart, life shared, heart-to-heart, -heart, is where I belong. Everything else is labeled, everything else is external, but... Heart to heart with God. That's where I belong. When um, God, our Father, made us just like we are for this relationship. So we got to work on the relationship. When I hear, I want to go touch on individuality one more second. Um, when I hear Aretha Franklin sing a song, um, there's no other voice like Aretha. When I hear Jimi Hendrix play his guitar, sorry, Todd, there's no other guitarist like Jimi Hendrix. When I hear Yo-Yo Ma play his cello, there's no other cellist like Yo-Yo Ma. There's something in that person that comes out in the way it's expressed, and you, I can just see Jimi going, I, I was made for this. Left-handed, sorry. I was made for this. Or Aretha singing. When you hear her voice, she was made for that voice. That voice was made for her. It's who she is. It's, and and Yo-Yo Ma and his cello, it's just like, this just fits the person so well. So God has a place and a gifting and a calling that fits you as individual as Aretha or Jimmy or Yo-Yo Ma. That fits you. And when you're giving voice to that expression of who God has made you, then you say, I was made for this, and it is beautiful. That's what I want for us. I want us to find that place that we are made for. That's where we belong, and it comes through God, not through our resume. He's the one who puts life into our inmost being. I want to share one more verse from um, Revelation, and then we'll um, kind of transition to the table. In Revelation chapter 7, I'm sorry, chapter 2 and 3, God has letters to seven churches. And again, it's relational. He says, okay, church, um, there are different cities in that region. And he says, okay, church, you do this well, this not so well, and so this is what you've got to work on. Seven churches. You do this well, this not well, this needs work. Seven churches. Okay, Bethel, I'm not sure what he says, this well, not, this not so well, this is what you've got to work on. You know, I'm sure he's got it. I haven't seen it. I uh, haven't figured it out yet. We're getting there. 
Okay, so he says that's the seven different churches. This is good. This is not so good. This is what you've got to work on. See, it's a relationship. It's not just, okay, you're my church. We're good. It's like, we've got to work on this. This is good. This is really good. Bless you for that. This, you could use some help with this one. It's not doing so well. So, but in one of these letters, in um, the uh, Revelations 2 and 17, there's one place where God says, to one who is victorious, I'll give some of the hidden manna. That means manna, you know what manna is. It's what uh, keeps you going through the wilderness, okay? I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Do you know that Father has a name for you and me when we walk in that relationship? I was preaching once, this is years ago, and a lady came up to me and said, he told me my name. And I said, don't tell me. <laughs> That's just between you and him. Sometimes, sometimes parents have a name for that kid and no one else knows that name, but it's you're my kid and this is my name for you. I once called my daughter uh, I mean, my daughter had a special nickname for me. And once I referred to something else by the same name, she was outraged. That's my name. You can't call that that. That's my name. Okay, it was a father error. Just to, and I didn't mean it the same level or anything else. But it's just like I, I used her name, her name, for something else. That's not right. God has a name that's your name written on a white stone, and we haven't even seen it yet. It's, that's a little bit down the road yet. But when we get there, he's got a name that's just for you. And no one else even knows. Your wife, your husband doesn't know. Your kids don't know. It's a name just for you and Father. And that's where we belong in the heart of God. That's where we belong in the heart of God. He's got a name for you, for me, and we can come to know him so, the way no one else on earth can do that. So I long for us to come, each one of us, to come to a place where we know God and God knows us and we've got a special name that no one else, we don't, we don't share this with anybody. This is just you and me. Father, this is just you and me right now. The secret place of the Most High. All right, we're going to move towards the table. I'm not going to have the worship team quite yet, just a minute for that. But... Um, the Lord wants us to come to his table. And so we've got the table here. The table here just represents a table that we're coming to all nations. Every, every language, every tribe, every people, every tongue will come to his table. But this represents it, and it represents both the death of Christ in the Passover meal, but also the wedding supper of the Lamb. So there's a lot in this table. I'm, we're not going too much into that right now. There's too much in it to talk about. But Jesus wants and invites us to his table, and it's a wide open invitation. He wants a relationship with us. It's not just that he wants to feed us, right? It's not, I, do, I go to a restaurant for that. But when I want to partake, participate, receive life from Jesus, this is where I come. This is one of the places I come. Okay, so I want to go to Isaiah 55. This is the Lord's invitation to you and me. Come, this is the Lord's invitation to you and me. Come, come. Is that too complicated? <laughs> come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. On you who have no money, you don't got to have the money, you don't have to have the job description. Come with no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and mil milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what doesn't satisfy? On bread, on what? Oh, sorry. Why spend money on what is not bread? and your labor on what does not satisfy. How many things do you labor on that do not satisfy? Listen, God says, listen to me and eat what is good. You will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. And one more verse, verse 8 of Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see. It's not just, oh, look and understand. There's something more relational about taking something in. You don't just say, oh, looks good. Interesting. But if it's taste and see, there's something that God has to offer us, offer me, that I can taste. I want us to taste the life of Jesus. And he invites us to come and taste his life. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, 
all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Father God, thank you that you do not leave us to walk this life alone, but you walk with us through the valleys, through the mountains. You walk with us in this life. Help us walk hand in hand with you. I'm going to bless you with the blessing that was taught to the Levitical priest in the book of Numbers. But I would also like to offer you, before I even do that, I'd like to say, if you would like to walk closer with God and you would like some prayer with that, we would be so happy to pray with you about that. That would give us, that would make my day if you want to walk closer with God. You can pray with me or when anyone who is serving today. You can probably talk with the person next to you in the row. We want to walk with God. He wants to walk with you. I'm going to sing, I'm sorry, we're going to do the Lord's blessing and then one more song. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. It's face to face, my friends. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.